Well, it is good to see each of you here once again this wonderful evening. I appreciate Michael and the songs in which he led us in. What a wonderful story it is, isn't it? The story of the reality of God's love for us and the opportunity that he has provided for us through his loving Savior and a home eternal in the heavens with him. In fact, that's really what our text is going to be dealing with in reality from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 1 through 10 this evening as we continue where we look where we left off talking about this time a house from God having looked last week at or uh, last week excuse me at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 7 through 18 on Paul dealing with and talking about the beauty and wonder and blessedness of being a minister of God, having started there in chapter 3 with such a discussion and finishing up there in chapter 4, and being a servant of God, therefore, as we preach the treasures in clays of, in jar clays, or in other words, that as teachers and workers for God, we are to make him, of course, the forefront of all that he is above all and is the potter. We are simply the clay, as Paul talked about. And that God has given us, Paul mentioned in this great letter there, the latter part of that section, those of the past and those of the present to be there who are faithfully and true, faithful and true, who have been there and done that, who have fought that good fight of faith, so that we are not alone in this journey here in this lifetime. That as we are ministers of God, teaching the treasures as jars of clay, that God is there for us and has given us those of great examples, such as in Hebrews chapter 11, for us to learn from and not feel alone. That brings us to our text there, as I said, starting chapter 5 and verses 1 through 10, where the Apostle Paul describes in inspiration the reality of being these earthen jars, these jars of clay, if you will, or ones who live here on earth as a tent or house being placed here, awaiting that great home above, eternal in the heavens, a house from God awaiting us on that great day. In fact, Paul would say there in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 1, for we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So what can we learn from our text today? If you have your hand out, the first thing Paul wants to really get across in this is that we are living here on this earth and that this life that we live is going to have its difficulties. This earthly home we are living in, the tent that is here, the home building, if you will, that we reside, our life here on earth is difficult. There's no escaping the fact that God chose to have us humans start their existence here on earth. There is no such thing as a human being born in the spiritual world. We all begin as dust from the ground. All of us other than Adam and Eve and Jesus are born uh, of woman due to the normal reproduction uh, pos made possible through creation, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 22. When that process takes place, as Job 33 and verse 4 states, God steps in and gives us life. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Once that takes place, of course, God watches over us, doesn't he? From the time we are made alive to the time we pass from this life, God is there to see us. As the psalmist said there in Psalm 139, even in the womb, he formed my inward parts. He knitted me together in my mother's womb, the psalmist would say. And that continues afterward, doesn't it? The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch, keeping watch on the evil and on the good. As you and I know so clearly, Sin came, unfortunately, into this world and made what God had made good and very good, Genesis chapter 1. There in Genesis chapter 3, damaged and deathly. 
that through one man Adam, Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, sin entered and has permeated this world ever since, Romans 3, 23, and has made this world Satan's kingdom, Matthew 12, 26 and John 12, 31. And it's because of that reality, we as humans, as these uh, earthly vessels living in this earthly tent, alive here on earth, in the physical, knowing the spiritual, that Paul writes what it means to be in the physical body as a faithful child of God in this old sinful world. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 through 4. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would further be, be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. What's Paul talking about there? He's saying that, listen, as Christians who are fighting that good to fight of faith, those who have been obedient to the will of God and are dealing with the difficulties of life, we're going to have those challenges. We're going to have these burdens we're going to have to deal with in this life. There are going to be times when we are groaning. One of the first things that it is made abundantly clear as we grow older is that this life we now have will one day be destroyed. Of course, we know Hebrews 9, 27, and, and just as is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. There is an appointed time for every single person. Then death will come. No one is going to defeat death. Even when Jesus returns, those who are alive, that physical body will be put to death. It is appointed for man to die once. This is reality. And it is a burden sometimes. There's a lot of things in this life we would like to accomplish. There's a lot in this life we would like to be involved with, whether it be our children's lives or our parents' lives or whatever the case may be. There are things in this life, and that's not a bad thing, that we enjoy. There are good things that God has created, such as our family and our friends and, and the church that we love and we want to be a part of and we want to be around. Even the Apostle Paul fought with this. He said, it's far greater for me to die and be with the Lord, but I, I also want to be here. I have things I want to do. I have people I want to see. I have, I have things that I want to be involved with. But that reality of life, though we know it's going to come to an end, that reality of life, as Paul points out, will have with it burdens. For the one who's living faithful and true, there's going to be burdens in this life. Not only the burden of knowing that we will physically end one day, but the burden of knowing that as we strive to live faithful and true, we still miss the mark of righteousness. We still sin. As John put, that, put it there in 1 John 1, 7, as you and I know, but if we walk in the light, as he is the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses or continually cleanses us from all sin. We need that blood continually because, as verses 8 and 10 point out, we sin as Christians. And the more faithful one becomes, the more dedicated to God they are, the more painful it is to sin. The more we mature in righteousness, the more we learn of our God's love for us, the more we start to understand more and more the depths of God's love and sending his son and all the things that go with that. And the more we grow in that, and the more we become more dedicated to God, the more we love God, the more that burden rises. It's hard to shake it off. I've given the illustration before of a very faithful man, a preacher who had been preaching for over 50 years, who asked a question during a forum, you know, I, I know when I sin and I ask God for forgiveness and, and it just it just still eats at me. I, 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 I struggle with that. How do I overcome it? And, and the response I always remember was you got to get over it because God's forgiven you. That's the simple answer, but it's harder to do sometimes. 
Because the more faithful we are, the more we know we crucify Christ in our sins. The more we know our God has done for us, the more we know we, how much love he has demonstrated towards us. The more painful it is to show and have that godly grief knowing that we need to repent once again because we have fallen short of the glory of God. It's a burden to go through this life as a faithful Christian in that sense, knowing intellectually that the blood of Christ is there to cleanse us emotionally that we have hurt our God once again. As we live faithful and true lives, there's another burden that comes upon us. And as we grow closer to God, another burden that will inevitably pop up in our lives. And that's knowing that those who are not faithful and true, whether they're lost or wayward, that they who love, used to love God or have never truly loved God, that they're lost. To have family members, to have friends, to have loved ones that have chosen the way of unrighteousness rather than righteousness, who have chosen to ignore God or put God second or third or fourth rather than first. It's a burden. The Apostle Paul reminded Romans chapter 9 and verse 3 of the great burden he felt in that. Having been one who had taught so many to be uh, dedicated to God in the Jewish religion against Christianity, and then coming to the truth, he would say this in Romans 9 and verse 3 to those Jewish Christians who had obeyed but were holding to that Judaism that he had so valiantly and effectively pushed for even destroying or, or uh, blowing up the church there in Jerusalem and scattering them everywhere. He says this, I, For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul said, I wish I could give my soul for everyone. My brethren, I have no doubt there are those that he had kept from Christ at one time on his mind that he wished he could go back to or convince again of the beauty, wonder, and love of God through Christ, that he truly was the Messiah. I'm sure we all have those in our lives we wish we could go back to and, and talk to, that we hadn't influenced the wrong way. It's a burden in this life. It's a burden to know that we're not perfect, we sin, and that others in our lives are not doing the right things as much as we want them to go to heaven. and We want them to do the right things. We want them to obey God. It's, it's a burden we must bear in this life. Another burden we must bear is the burden of persecution for the righteous. The ones who are faithful and true are going to deal with persecution. We all know the passage there in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. Those who desire to live godly lives will suffer persecution. The Beatitudes there in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 11, Jesus said, Blessed or happy are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Jesus said, listen, when you fight the good fight of faith, when you are his disciple, when you take up his cross daily and you put away all the things of this world, putting him first, whether it be family or friends or job or whatever, when we do that, we're going to suffer. We're going to bear the burden of persecution. We're going to deal with that from within and from without. The reality is this life certainly has its challenges, doesn't it? And Paul points that out in our text here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. We're going to have burdens we bear. We're going to groan from time to time. We're going to have rampant sin and be ineffective and go have our ups and our downs, but even striving to walk in the light will have its moments of what feels like unbearableness. Life is ugly. Life is painful. And it's downright difficult, isn't it? It's hard to go through this. But the apostle doesn't leave the text there inspired with such drought and such uh, pain in it. No, as we read, and we'll focus this time rather on what we look forward to, not the difficulties in this life, but the life that is great in the next life. Because the next life is great, isn't it? 
It is an eternal home. Notice what Paul says there again as we focus on that home from God not made with hands. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, which we talked about, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put our heavenly uh, put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, notice, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. What a beautiful passage. Paul, who knew difficulty, didn't he? Paul, who had been imprisoned and had got out of prison. Paul, who would be executed. Paul, who had been beaten several times, who had been stoned and left for dead, who had been shipwrecked, who had been all sorts of things. Who, even tradition says, was, if I remember right, hung upside down on a cross. The Apostle Paul was an amazing man. But he said, as challenging and difficult, to, difficult as this life can be, and the burdens as faithful Christians we must suffer, we don't go through those ignorantly. We don't suffer those and just say, I'll deal with it. No, we have something greater in mind. The new life to come is going to be so much greater than the life we have on earth that is given to us by God first and foremost. God is the one who will provide that life that is eternal in the heavens. Jesus would say it this way in John 14, 1 through 3. Let not your hearts be troubled again, dealing with the difficulties and trials of life. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. For were not so, would I have told you that I go prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. God is going to give us this new life, this new life that is the next life. It comes from God, not from man. And therefore, because this new life is in heaven, and because this new life comes from God, there are no difficulties. There are no burdens. It's perfect in every way. The great apostle there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 42 through 43, said it this way. This new life we will have in this new body says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown perishable, notice, what is raised imperishable, it is sown in dishonor, will be raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it will be raised in power. It is greater in every way to the infinite degree. We go through the burdens of this life and deal with it knowing we're going to have those because we realize the next life is greater. The next life is better in every way. And it's obvious that heaven cannot properly be described. God cannot put it in great detail for us. Words cannot explain what it means to literally be in the bosom of God, the house of God, and in his home. In Revelation chapter 4, I think we have one of the greatest offerings God can give us as insight into this. In Revelation chapter 4, remember John the Apostle has been taken up and the door has been opened and he can see into heaven itself, the eternal home in which God resides and the angels are, and he goes to describe what he sees there. We're just going to read a few verses, but I want you to notice what the angelic beings uh, are doing in heaven. It says, And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night. They never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. The angelic beings who were created in heaven and have witnessed God all this time says day and night. This is what John saw. They are in such gratitude and amazement and wonder and it's so great that they can't help day and night but worship God screaming and praising holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Of the 24 elders that are talked about there, in the next few verses there in 10 and 11 says, 
Then the 24 elders fall down before him, that's God the Father, who is seated on, seated on the throne, and worship him and live forever and ever. They cast their crowns down before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Whether it be the martyrs or the elders or the angelic beings, Heaven is going to be great. There will be nothing like it that we can consider or comprehend. It will be so much further beyond what we can even imagine that Paul continues in our text to describe and try to get across that even though we have all these burdens in this earthly life as these jars of clay, that even though we have all these challenges and these persecutions, and even though this life is going to end, and, and everything that comes with it. Heaven is so great, and that eternal home above is so wonderful, and the new body that we are going to receive is so powerful, and so imperfect, and so great, that even that because of all that, this life is encouraging. It's encouraging because we know the end from the beginning in this particular case. Even though, as I said, this life has its ups and downs, its challenges, its burdens. For the faithful, for the ones who love God, we're encouraged each and every day. We have new courage and are reinvigorated every time we wake up, knowing that we're that much closer to that which, which is better. The Apostle Paul would say it this way, starting in verse 5 through verse 10. He who has prepared us for the very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For if we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we made it our aim to please him. For we must, all be, uh, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. For those of us who are faithful and true, who have hungered and thirst, thirsted for Christ and his word, we know the promises of God. We know, though we cannot comprehend, how much greater the next life is from this. And because of that, though we're being persecuted, and though we sin and we come back to God, and, and, and with all our heart we wish we, we would never sin again, all the burdens that can be found, we still find courage because we know what is next. We know what comes after this life. We know right now that we have eternal life if we are faithful and true. After all, isn't that what the apostle of love wrote there in 1 John 5, 13? I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. The apostle Paul, once he became faithful, as he said, in all good conscience, he fought that good fight of faith. He sought to receive the crown of life. And he is imploring those of Corinth who have repented and who have come back to God and who are trying so desperately to do what's right. He's imploring them to know they have eternal life, to be encouraged in this day, no matter what the burdens bring, no matter what difficulties you have, because you know what awaits, you know the end from the beginning. That's why we as Christians can rejoice in the Lord always. And again, he writes, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. How do we rejoice? It's because not of this life, but the next. It's because you and I can know we have eternal life, that it has been guaranteed by God if we are faithful and true. And if we are, and when we finish that good fight, 
And we reach that heavenly home above, not made with hands. And we are transformed in this body from the weak to the powerful, the imperfect to the perfect, the physical to the spiritual. God has guaranteed through his promises that we will be with him for eternity. And that is encouraging in this life, no matter what challenges we go through. No matter what difficulties we find ourselves in. It is easy. Knowing that. The glory that awaits. And the help that we can receive from each other. To get to heaven. That doesn't mean there won't be difficulties and challenges. That doesn't mean we won't have ups and downs. That doesn't mean we won't have burdens. We most certainly will. But with God's help and him for us and with each other helping us, we can get to be with our God forever. But it takes us taking up our cross daily. It takes us being willing to give up everything for our God and put away anything that would hinder us from fighting that good fight of faith. The eternal rest we have at our very fingertips is guaranteed if we do such. It's not if we don't. Again, we're not talking about perfection. God's blood recognizes that, as will our love for him when we suffer those burdens of sin. But as we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we are promised and guaranteed a home above this evening as you reflect upon your walk with God. I hope you're looking to the house from God that he has promised you. A home prepared for you, not with hands, but by God in the heavenly places. A home that cannot rot, that will not be destroyed, and will have God everlasting as your neighbor. Right there with you. Where it will be so amazing, according to what we read there in Revelation 4, that day and night we will not be able to help but throw our crowns of victory before him and worship him, for it will be so glorious and so wonderful. This evening, as you reflect upon that walk with God, maybe you're struggling. This life is challenging. Those burdens can become great. And if you have not thrown those anxieties and those burdens away and given them over to God, whether it be through repentance and prayer or through help of your family, do that tonight. Your family here wants to encourage you. We want to be there for you and strengthen you. If you need that love this evening, let us know by coming forward as we stand and as we sing.